Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I first, of course, want to thank the Academy of Urbanism for nominating Antwerp and nominating Hamburg and Lyon. And I also want to thank you for the invitation to tell you here about uh, my city. Let me first swiftly sketch the city. Antwerp, as you might know, of course, is centrally located in the northwestern part of Europe some 50 kilometers of uh, Brussels, some two or three hours by TGV train to capitals like Paris, London, and uh, uh, Amsterdam. It's counting 500,000 inhabitants, but the area, the territory, the surface of the city is quite large. That is because we have a port. The port of Antwerp is the second port in Europe. In some minutes, my counterpart of Hamburg will tell you that Hamburg is the second part of Europe. <laughs> 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 what, uh, what is without discussion, Antwerp is of course still uh, the first center of diamond trade in the world. 80% uh, of the rough diamonds are traded in Antwerp. Very small business with very large economy. And then recently, Antwerp got a new base in uh, developing a lot of creative industries, especially fashion. Uh, designing fashion and uh, selling fashion is uh, very important to the city. Still, Antwerp is, we know it, one of those second cities in Europe. It's not the first city, it's the second city, and we love to be the second city. Perhaps this kind of map is uh, more suited uh, to describe you the territory where Antwerp is situated. So this is the built-up map of Flanders. This is Brussels, Antwerp, Ghent, and Louvain. As you can see, the inner area in between the cities has been uh, quite completely built up. We had a massive sprawl, a massive suburbanization after World War II. So that it means that cities in Flanders are not something solitary or isolated in the countryside. Cities are a city within one congregation. Flanders is one city, Antwerp is in fact just a point of intensity in this new city. We call it Nebelstadt, the Nibeler city, misty city. For me, Antwerp is a city at the river. When you see the city, you recognize immediately the traditional concentric pattern of the European city. 16th century, 16th century city, with the boulevards around it, on the former Spanish fortifications. The 19th century city, with the 20th century railroad, with the highway, on the former uh, late 19th century fortifications. And then uh, the, the roads going through to suburbia. But then, of course, this radio concentric pattern in Antwerp is disturbed. It's disturbed by the river, by the scout. So that's why Antwerp is also a north south city. And in a minute, you will see that's the shift we want to make. We want to turn now Antwerp from a city that has not so much relation with the river to a city that has more relation to the river. In order to have the port, Port, as in all European cities, is moving down the stream, so it's a world apart. In fact, the port has left the city. In the image of the city today, the port is not present anymore. And then on the left bank, on the other bank, you have a very special piece of the city and a modernist extension of the 1930s, 1950s. Not the kind of poor French banlieue. It's not a difficult area. It's middle class. It's very decent and very neat. Then in my quick overview of uh, recent urban planning history in Antwerp, I start with a counter image. This was urban spatial planning in the 1970s in Flanders. Two-dimensional zoning. The kind of spatial planning that is uh, fitted for urban expansion but that is not working anymore when it's about urban transformation. And urban transformation, that's the problem or the issue we have since the deindustrialization of the city. It's 
not anymore about expanding the city, it's about filling the urban voids that are starting to get better to rise within the city itself. It's the slaughterhouses, the docklands, the railway yards, the military installation, the warehouses, the docklands. These kind of issues have risen, have, have, uh, uh, have been rising. Uh, a new kind of urban design, a new kind of urban planning in the farmers as in many ways in the group. We call it in Dutch Stadsontwerp, in French it's the Projet Urbain, in English it's something like urban design projects like this. Then one of the turning points in Antwerp, one of the newest, uh, one of the, the new uh, illustrations of this new urban uh, planning policy did, come, did not come from the city government, did not come from the politicians, but really came bottom up from the civil society. It was an association of local teachers, local professors in urban planning, local architects, local citizens, that organized an international competition at the end of the 1980s, Stadt aan de Stroom, City and River, uh, and that was really very successful, a lot of international architects uh, participating in the competition. That competition, that's really a kind of red line uh, during all of the next years until now. So this is a plan by Toyo Ito for the competition. Today we are developing that area with a new urban plan, with a new competition. The same idea is still inspiring uh, the actual project. So that's very interesting in Antwerp that there is this kind of continuity of ideas. On that moment, ideas, because they were not picked up by the, the uh, local government. It's only in the mid-1990s that things began to change. That's when money met the ideas. Suddenly, in those, in those years, there were a lot of uh, urban renewal funds available, and then finally, the local government realized that they, if they would like to succeed in profiting from these funds, they would need new urban renewal ideas. And then both currents came together, and then things started going on. So I would like to show you now three projects that date from that period. And what they have in common is that they all started not as urban planning projects, not as projects about quality architecture, as it is very important now in Antwerp, but in fact projects about social restructuring. So this, they only gradually became a project about urban planning. And this combination of social policy and spatial policy that's really embedded now in the city. And we tried really hard to keep those two policies go hand in hand. So the station area, a very beautiful station, uh, has been developed up as a TGV station in the 1990s, so it has in fact confirmed the centrality of the station in the city. But then the area was also a classical sta station area, difficult area, parts of it were in the UK, a lot of drug dealers, etc. And then the city decided in 1999 to buy one of the largest premises from a car dealer uh, premise uh, very near to the station. And they bought it, they demolished it, and they turned it into the new central city library. So the strategy was quite clear. This is an area which is in decay. It becomes a no-go area was sliding away from the mental map of the Antwerp people and by putting the central city library over there you forced in fact all Antwerpian people who wanted to go to the library <coughs> to go back to that area and gradually the area was re-won, was regained in the mental map of the Antwerpians. Second uh, project from that period, <coughs> that's the Sailor's Park in the north of the city next to the 19th century port. So that's the place where the sailors go and the boats and the ship are on the port. That means it's a prostitution bar quarter. It was traditionally in the prostitution bar quarter. It was at the end of the 1990s also a quarter full of uh, malafide businesses. So you could buy false Rolexes over there. You could also 
was a real Kalashnikovs. <laughs> <laughs> there was really a problem. Again, one of those no-go areas in the city. Hardly any normal inhabitants living there. Then the city decided to clear up the area, not by pushing, well, yes, by pushing the Malafita business away. They are now in Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> but not by pushing the prostitution away. So we accepted the window prostitution on condition that it would be more safe, more healthy, and more fair. So this was the area end of the 1990s. Empty parcels, buildings used for prostitution, only men on the street. And this is the area now. The window of prostitution has been restricted to three streets and is now accommodated with much more quality. On the corner, you see the new municipal health center that has been built uh, by the city, especially aimed at the prostitutes. The interesting thing here is this is, of course, social policy. But that building was the reason for one of the first new competitions of new generation in Antwerp. So it was very, it's very interesting for me that this kind of program can be the subject of an architectural competition too. It shows very much how spatial policy and social policy grow and invest. The last project <coughs> is also in the northern part of the city. It's a large park. Called Park School North, or because it's a former railway yard, uh, huge size, 24 hectares, 80 hectares were developed as a public park, and then the project development will be is in realization now, but in the scope we have, it will be concentrated in the head of the park and in a high-rise development. The area looks like that and huge empty sites in the middle between two of the most dense areas and poor areas of the northern part of the city but entirely invisible at that time because there was a wall around and no one knew there was such an open area behind. The park is open now since uh, something like three or four years. It's a huge success. It's a success that is problematic because it's difficult to maintain now. Uh, it works on two levels, and that's again the social thing and the spatial thing going together. So it works as a garden for the neighborhoods, because in that area people don't have a private garden. But it also works as a, as a park on the level of the city as a whole. And many people of Antwerp go there during the weekend, having a barbecue, etc. So, social policy and spatial policy go hand in hand. Then, after these projects, we were quite happy, but then we realized we can't go on like that. If you have everywhere separate projects, then you have to integrate them, and you, have, you risk that they become food loose, and you have to provide a framework for them. That's what we made with the Antwerp uh, Spatial Structure Plan. It's a plan for the whole of the city, but it's not defining everything in the city. All the white parts where we have a suggestive general policy. For the colored parts, we have a very precise, specific policy. That's where the strategic projects are. The structure plan has been really important for Antwerp. There is a, communica a communication campaign with the new logo of Antwerp, no that is the kind of uh, community engagement counterpart of the plan. It's also the political counterpart. The same way as the, the, the Antwerp Structure Plan wants to see the city as a whole, the Great Lady A is also saying that we are all one city. The new city slogan is status van iedereen. That means the city belongs to everyone. Second uh, important consequences of the Structure Plan is we reorganized the structure of the city. So the city departments of urban planning are now organized <coughs> according with the structure of the structure plan. We have departments for the generic policy and we have departments for the specific policy. It's kind of a matrix figure where then my job is not about me, it's working in a horizontal way through all departments. And thirdly, so of course the main uh, importance of the structure plan that it really 
functions daily as a framework for all of the strategic projects. Strategic pro for the strategic projects, you should check on the website of Antwerp. I just want to prove here that the structure plan is not a paper plan, but that's what the, we are realizing the plan. So in the structure plan, the hard spine, the yellow red area, is important. That's the place where we want to emphasize the new development of the city, so that the city becomes closer to the river. We are realizing it today in the northern part, with the energy, the master plan for the energy, in the middle part, with the refurb refurbishment plan for the keys, because we have to widen the water barrier due to more risks of flooding due to climate change. And then in the southern part, with the new city extension, a neighborhood, a sustainable neighborhood for 5,000 people, with a plan made by the Italian architects Secchi and Vigano, very much inspired by the Toyo Ito plan, perpendicular to the river, so that you don't have the gold edge on the first side, but that everyone who lives there has a relation with the river. As a counterpart, I want to show you something else because we have a lot of we have those strategic projects. So that's a kind of classic method. In Antwerp, we also have uh, a complementary program of what we call the Vespa Housing Program. Vespa is the real estate uh, company of the city. It buys everywhere in the city individual houses, empty parcels, the kind of things that the private market is not interested in because it's too difficult. It's in a difficult neighborhood, or it's on a corner, and the private market prefers standard things. Then the houses are demolished or sometimes renovated, a new one is built, and that one is sold on the market again. So we have to subsidize something like 15, 10 or 15, 15%, so we have a loss. But because we buy and sell, it's kind of a growing fund, so we have a lot of impact without putting too much money. So there are now, now something like 500 houses realized or realization in Antwerp. We call it urban adventure because it's by doing small things, having an influence on the street, on the area. We see that other people start renovating their houses themselves. The interesting thing is also that it's a reason for architecture competitions among young architects. So again, we combine both things. So we help them starting uh, up their businesses and they help us by exploring new kinds of typologies. I'll take five minutes more, otherwise I have to stop here. Because I want to tell you about this slow curve. So when we started developing, what you know, developing or redeveloping the air engine that the port area in Antwerp it has taken many years. When we started developing, we were quite jealous and we looked at London documents. In the minute, we uh, quickly realized we went to the Netherlands and we see there everywhere those projects uh, at an incredible pace and we were going very slowly. The reason why we, we go slowly is because land ownership is very much fragmented in Belgium and so the building market sector is also supplied rather small scale. So in fact, slow urbanism is not the method, it's a condition. We can't do something else. And then after some time, we realized, well, this slowness is not the problem. It's a gift because it avoids that we have this kind of instant city feeling as you have in many of those Dutch uh, new neighborhoods that they look incredibly new and after 10 years they were already look incredibly uh, dated, uh, outdated. It's also producing more variety. It's also integrating time in the project. So during, we have a master plan for the air engine, but we've changed it already several times. So we know it has to be flexible. We know we have a goal, but the way we go there is changing. It's integrating time, new market conditions, other lifestyles popping up, a new stuff called Maester, the 
it's a, we it is our ambitious. So these kind of things, they produce, in our view, a more layered city, a more sustainable city, a more culturally sustainable city. I'll skip that one too. Well, no, I will tell you about Because slow urbanism, in fact, of course, the comparison is with slow food, as you may know. Yes? Slow food is about paper time, paper time, producing, cooking good food, eh? but also using local ingredients, local produce. Take, taking into account the specific context of the place where you are. And that's what we do in Antwerp too. So this is the, the mass building, the new museum on the Strom, built on a very historical place in the middle of those documents, but still yet fits there well. It's built by a Dutch architect, Nuttelings, but here in Antwerp he has made one of his most Flemish buildings. <coughs> So this slow urbanism is also about adapting to the local context, about having foreign architects, but not foreign architecture. About having foreign architects and who are willing to uh, fit into our local context. Stone is an Indian stone, natural stone, but it's very, uh, it matches very well our brick, our warehouse in brick in the neighborhood. Um, so. That brings me to the last point. That's about openness. Antwerp is a small city, but because of its important port, it's open to the world. We have 170 nationalities in this small city of 500,000 people. So we've been used to being cosmopolitan, to having foreign people in the city. That's why we have also a very open uh, culture in organizing competitions. So we are very much open to foreign architects, like this one, Bernardo Secchi and Paola Villano. But on the other side, we have also those local architects, Flemish architects, doing very good things and going abroad with these things. The square by Paul Oblecht and Dam, now set the Venice panel, get all on the show. To sum it up, I think we have in Antwerp, you have to be clear about that. The position of the political leader is very important. We have in Antwerp, we have in Antwerp a coalition where the first point is that the first and main objective in the city government coalition is the high, high quality of urban development. So we have political ambition, we have long-term vision, that's the structure plan, and we have special instruments for the operating uh, realization separate agencies who work according to the structure plan and stuff against it. And those three politics, vision and instruments, they work now in the very good And that will last until it lasts. Thank you.